of glasses of 15% mead, you know, as a responsible <laughs> business owner. That, that happened so, to me in so Washington. Just, they poured uh, me like a nine ounce glass. I'm going, a pint of mead. I got to drive. <laughs> got to drive. Yeah. <laughs> if I put a pint of mead that's 5.7 or 6.2 in front of you, that changes things that drastically. That totally changes the picture, exactly. And, you know, from a saleability standpoint, that also lets you go head to head with beers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think price point as well. I mean, if you if you start looking at the the mechanism by which you make a, a, a you know a session mead that that's got that that low ABV and you know maybe it's a traditional or maybe you've added something else and you know if you think about a methaglin, those can be those can be relatively inexpensive and very competitive with with a glass of, of craft beer. And I think that that's that's going to create an accessibility scenario that is not that common yet, but I think it's going to become a lot more common, which think is the goal for all of us is that means more people will be drinking meat mm-hmm. so yeah i think you know that's kind of where i saw the sweet spot is is that if i'm going to take education seriously as part of my business then i would want to put stuff in people's hands that they that they turn to more often than they do now because they won't be in hawk to do so yeah. you know they won't pay they won't pay 30 bucks for a bottle that they don't end up being able to drink you know it, it's that that sort of thing, I think, it dissuades people. You know that that price point conversation you had in your head while you're looking at that bottle on the shelf. You know, thirty dollars is a lot to put out there. I mean, mm-hmm. I can probably get two half gallon gallon growlers of session mead. So you got a gallon of session mead to take to a party for thirty bucks. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, that, I, and this totally... was a five hundred mil bottle, so it wasn't even a right. full seven fifty mil bottle. And yeah. yeah, and you're right. I mean, that's a big thing. The other thing that I see that I think is really interesting is. The fact that it seems like very, very soon you'll be able to go buy a six pack of meat. People are canning. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And it's that's that I think is is probably more of a size issue for anybody who's making, you know, cannibal product, whether it's session meat or they want to be crazy and want to put high ABV wine in a can. You know, you can do that too if you want. I mean, there's people are. <laughs> right. There's not, definitely nothing stopping you from doing that. But it's definitely a size issue. If you look around, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at options for that. And there are these little, you know, sort of semi-automated manual canning systems that you can get that you can do, you know, one fill at a time and kind of crimp tops on yourself and everything. I'm oh like, my God, right, well, that would be so time consuming. Oh, <laughs> it, it certainly would, but it might provide you an outlet for additional accessibility, which could get you to the point of making big enough batches that you could go and They're have automated. a mobile can. Yeah. yeah. Mobile can or come in or ultimately, you know, size up and, and buy yourself a canning line, which is by no means, a, you know, a small nut to, yeah. no, to put really out. To be- well, yeah, but how it's one of those things where how long does it take for a canning line to pay for itself rather than having to buy bottles all the time? That. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's definitely a, a, a price differential there, and I I haven't priced it out, but I'm certainly not putting a canning line, you know, in my initial business plan because I think it's a little bit out of reach. But yeah. I it it's there's a break point there where I, I'd love it if it was easier to, to go right to canning because you could eliminate the glass. It's a lot to ship it. You know, it's people are recycling it, which is great, but it'd be awesome if we could recapture it and reuse it because for 15 years I've very rarely bought glass. I mean, I, I've I've never bought glass beer bottles except if they were used from a friend who, yeah. you know, gave me a couple bucks a case because he didn't want to delabel them anymore. Yeah. But commercially that's totally not viable as well <laughs> it's you know? also exactly illegal, I believe. Yeah, yeah you you're not allowed to do anything except to use yep. new bottles i believe yep yeah, yeah so I, can't, got a, definitely... I got a half dozen cases of champagne bottles that way because the guy that was using them in his meadery they got dirty and he couldn't use them so he's like you want the i got them for like a third of what he paid for them mm. but, yeah i'm still working my way through those because i had like six cases of them yeah, the folks in my homebrew club are going to be pretty happy with me fairly soon because I'm going to go through the stack of boxes of bottles in the garage and be like, "All right, I don't need any of these. Who wants them? And you just come and get them." I, oh I, my! Please give me way. Give me back my garage. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. and I know people will take them because most of them are probably just need a clean, don't have labels on them anymore, and you know I'm I'm kegging a lot of stuff these days, so I'm not looking to keep bottles around as nearly as much as I used to. Yeah, and if you've got the setup for that, it's great. I wish I could get out of bottles too because they're taking over my entire base. Uh, same here. I got stacks and bags and uh, buckets of them everywhere. And my husband's like, yep. are you going to do something with these? I'm like, well, eventually I'm going to fill them. 
Yeah, and he's like, well... Absolutely, honey. Yes, yes, I will. Yeah, that was Don't the plan. Don't ask when. No, I just have them laying around because I have no intention of ever using them. Yeah, no, I'm hoarding bottles, dear. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Could be worse. <laughs> yeah, I'll do something with them, just not today. Just not today, right. yep. Later. Yeah. Yep. God, I, I wish I had more time to make mead. And, you know, as it is, I sort of live vicariously through everybody else's mead making. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so you're going straight up session meads, right? Um, so not entirely. The, the plan is to have both uh, a, a session mead and a dessert mead line. Oh, okay. Um, also on the cider side, again, I see ciders and the session meads is, is much more of kind of the one, the same product. They're, you know, obviously their ingredients are, are slightly different, but they're going to be processed and packaged the same way. Yeah. Um, and I, we, we just did our first uh, consumer feedback tasting over the weekend. And what I learned from that is, is that, I need both product lines. Some people love the session meads. Some people love the dessert meads. There was overlap, but there was a clear distinction. You know, as we work through the session meads, some people were like, yeah, I just don't really get this. This isn't, you know, I I don't kind of see myself drinking a pint of mead. And I'm like, well, not yet, but let me work on you. We'll get there. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. We understand. We can teach you. (laughs) Yeah. There's a a self-help group for it. It's called Ancient Fire. Don't worry. We'll invite you over anytime you need help. (laughs) And when we got to the dessert meads, some of those same people were completely sure they understood it because they, you know, they had had much of my stuff in the past. Because we we started our first group with some folks that have been very honest with them in the past, so we wanted to see how that honesty would translate into to collecting good feedback. But they were very very comfortable in the dessert mead area. They they kind of knew what it was all about. The ciders they were a little more comfortable with, but the session mead they were kind of like, eh, yeah, I don't really know what I what I think about this. So I think there's definitely two distinct audiences for it, and then some of each of those people will, you know, cross back and forth. So that affirmed for me that I need both because I need to appeal to the broadest range of consumer because maybe somebody's going to come in and say, I love coming in and getting a couple of samples of the session meads, but you know what? It's not what I want to buy to take home. Okay, that's cool. Here, we have these other things. I can respect that that too. Yeah, pay me for a couple of samples and then take a couple of bottles of what you really want home. I got no problem with that. As long as they're <laughs> buying, who cares what they're buying? Yeah. So, not going to tell you. Y- you're right. Not going to say no. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, don't give me your money. Please yeah. don't give me your money. <laughs> don't say that. People will hear you. Uh, <laughs> so, so since you're working with both kinds of meads, I want to hear your take on um, you know a regular normal strength, if you will, 9 to 11% mead versus a session mead in terms of um, difficulty to make it? Okay, so I think the first the first thing that I'll say I think I run into with difficulty is that the duration of the fermentation for the stronger mead is longer, which means you have more yeast health, yeast nutrition, and yeast management awareness you have to have just because you've got more sugar the yeast are going to work harder. They're going to work longer. You, if you don't care and feed for them as as well as you need to, it can go awry fairly quickly because the conditions in that mead, I think, can go wrong be in a in a more profound way. What I see on the session mead side is they go quickly. I mean, I'm let me pull up my log sheet real quick and see what the 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 um the the smallest gravity I've done on once because I think I'm getting down now let's see I've got a strawberry lemonade going right now and that was at 1068 and that's not really as low as I think I want to go I think I have a couple of other recipes that are kind of sitting in the hopper right now 1052 I mean that that's a that's a lightish beer you know that's a I don't know uh that an ordinary bitter and the beer world you know that has five percent alcohol in it and those fermentations if you if you dose them with a good healthy colony of rehydrated yeast and give them new, you know nutrients for a couple of days they're, they're done in four or five days oh okay you know so you so where you've got less than a week of fermentation time ideally if you've got something that's up to 1120 or 1130 or 1140 on the hydrometer you, you got three weeks yeah before that's probably mm-hmm. going to be completely done. So it depends on your yeast, of course. But yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I found when I've done lower alcohol meads yep. is that they go so much faster. And a lot of times, a lot of times I end up like missing my nutrients markers because they blow right past it. Yeah, I'm missing the third one. Like, if I do them on days one, two, and three, some of those ones, they're far enough along on day three that I don't want to add the nutrients because mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to help. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think with the, the stronger meads, I, I think anybody who's contemplating, well, how's this process going to work differently, is if you're already paying good attention for your yeast health all the way through you know, a two- to three-week ferment now, don't expect to have to watch it that long. But again, don't skip, like do your nutrients on day one and day two. You don't want to skip that because it's going to move and it's going to move pretty fast nonetheless. And and keeping it healthy for those first couple of days is a a big benefit. After that, and you you mentioned yeast. With the lighter meads, it doesn't really matter what yeast you use because most of them are going to dry it out. Okay. It doesn't matter what you use. A- ale yeast, wine yeast, you know, even the, the the wine yeast with the lowest, you know, ABV potential you have. I'm seeing, you know, I've used a couple 12 and a half, 13 percent. If it's 1052, it's going to dry it out. It's there's no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. What I think the key is, is that once you get down to that one or 0.99 on the hydrometer, you got to get it into the cold somehow. You got to cold crash it. You got to get the yeast to, to, to go to sleep. You got to get them to drop out as much as possible because you really just don't want anything else to happen with it. You don't really want it to go. I had a couple that it got down to like 0.995. And, and despite the fact that's not a big difference, it was too dry. Oh, and okay. then, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and back sweetening it then, it just doesn't taste complete. Like you've stripped just the last amount of body out of it. And you can add some of that back, but it's, there's, um, I don't know, I'd say it's almost like a bitterness sometimes because it's, uh-huh. it's gone too far. So once you get down to around like 1002 to 1004 on the, on the hydrometer, I try to get it out in the cold. This time of year is perfect because I got a three season porch that's not heated. So yeah. I can just take a bucket and dump it out there. But for anyone who's like, oh, I don't have the ability to do that. Well, I, I get it, but if you let it go completely dry on its own, you might not be all that happy with it. That's where you want to go to Craigslist, find an old frigidator that you can get cheap as long as it does, it still works, and then rip all the shelves out of it and blam. Or, you know, if you can't find that, then you get an upright freezer, the, the old kind like Grandma used to have, those ones that open mm-hmm. at the top, and those sell brand new at Home Depot, big enough to put two five-gallon carboys in for 150 bucks. You know, you yep. can, so that means you can get them on Craigslist for not very much money. You know? <laughs> yep. Yeah, and I think at that point. The feed. <laughs> yes, I am. I hadn't scrolled down far enough. I hadn't seen it. I had to scroll my window going, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got three of those fridges at the moment, and uh, I picked up all of them for free off the off the, um, uh, Side sidewalk, the you call it? Yeah. Nature Strip, yeah. Sidewalk Depot, yes. Uh, yeah, here here you get what you get is the rich folks put that stuff out for the junk man to come take, and you just go tr- trolling through the rich neighborhoods, trying not to look like That's a person who's breaking into houses and pick up their trash. You know. See, my brother does reno, so all I have to do is tell him to look out for a good one. There you go. So my, my problem is not finding the stuff; it's finding the space. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing here is uh, we're fi- we're fixing to ditch the uh, freezer that nearly died that caused the great fruit exodus. It actually <laughs> still works. We're able to recover the power on it, but because we're talking about buying a new freezer, what I think I'm going to do is repurpose that one since it uh-huh. does still work, you know. And I'll just turn the temperature up so it's not freezing. And uh, unless, of course, I want to freeze distill my meads, which would be illegal. Um, for you, maybe not for me. Well, okay, <laughs> yeah. If you're in the United no, States, no, for me. Yeah, if you're in the United States, that is illegal. If you're in Canada or Australia, it's a different story. Check your local laws. Just, you know, <laughs> that's my got me disclaimer for the day. Well, okay, at least the first one anyway. <laughs> I checked. If, if you're dead. in New Zealand, you're allowed to use a pot still. Oh, jeez. Cool. Wow. Well, they do that here, but they're off in the woods somewhere with a bunch of guys that'll shoot you if you get too close, you know, so. <laughs> um, you know, it's, yeah, I know a few people who do it, but don't tell anybody about don't it. Don't tell anybody. But, yeah, I used to people yeah. go. People used to ask me, "Can you get moonshine?" And be like, "Well, I think I might know a friend of a friend of a friend," because you know? <laughs> it does turn up at events every now and then with the uh, with the, in my black powder shooting organization. Every now and then, you'll you'll see somebody. But uh, Dot Made does not condone any illegal activity. <laughs> that is exactly correct. Yep. 
Got me. Got me. Will delete discussion of any illegal activities on the forum or in the groups, you know? unless they are specified for information purposes only. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Do we do we really think we have law enforcement listening tonight? Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. For a long time, and, and I, don't, know. I don't know if it's still true, especially at the beginning of the.